a strong finish. <laughs> okay, so just as he opened Apex, David Schwartz will be joining us on stage to give his closing remarks and also to take your questions from X. He'll be joined on stage by George Calais from The Block uh, in a fireside chat. Take it away, guys. <laughs> David, thanks for joining me. George, you look good. You've been working out. You know, it's just all the, the Stroop waffles. <laughs> um, well, I have heard a lot of murmurings about your sense of humor throughout the uh, <laughs> event. Um, Got me into a lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if actually we could start there. I think the audience would love to hear a joke just to kick things off. You know, since you asked so nicely, I guess I will lead with a joke. So, uh, unfortunately, two weeks ago, my uncle passed away. You don't have to be sad. It's just a setup for the joke. Um, and I found out that I had inherited a painting and a violin, and I got pretty excited, so I had them appraised and authenticated. It turns out I am the proud owner of a Stradivarius and a Rembrandt. Sadly, Stradivarius is a shit painter, and Rembrandt doesn't make very good violin. <laughs> right, we start. Perfect. It's yeah. timely. I actually, uh, just two days ago, uh, before the event, was at the Rijksmuseum. Uh, so, got to enjoy some of the uh, Amsterdam culture. But I have to say, this event has been really impressive. And you guys have been doing it for what, four years now? Yep. Wow. So, I guess it would be great uh, to hear a little bit about what you took away from this year's event. and. Kind of how the whole experience has evolved over the past couple of years. Well, I mean, this is much, much larger. The number of people is just, I think it's something like 700 people, you know, which is just twice what we had last year. And just the rate of growth has just been outstanding. Um, there's been kind of a change in the, in the people. There's still a lot of developers, a lot of business people. But I think for the first time, I think we've seen a lot of people who are just like sort of retail and user participants who are coming to see what's going on. Mm. And that's super exciting. I always come back from these events energized. You know, um, the, the community is like an abstract thing to me. And even when I meet people on Zoom or, you know, when I talk to people, it doesn't have the impact of walking into a room with hundreds of people, just the visceral impact of that and the way it just makes, makes everything so tangible. It's just, it's just an amazing experience. And I just thank you for everybody who's made this experience so fantastic. This is the first year we had sponsors. Never had sponsors at Apex before. I think you've seen some of the booths here, like a significant presence of companies showing what they were building. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's super exciting. Wow. Well, there's one thing you left out, which is all the announcements that Ripple made. Uh, you mind kind of giving a TLDR on all the stuff on the roadmap to come after this? Well, so <laughs> two of the announcements are kind of funny. So we announced the name of the Ripple stablecoin as Ripple USD. That's what probably most of you are calling it anyway, so not very surprising announcement. The ticker symbol, RLUSD. Um, congrats to the Twitter sleuths who figured that one out before the announcement too. Um, that's, that's, by the way, Twitter sleuths are just absolutely amazing. You just cannot keep anything secret in the social media age. Then there was the announcement of uh, the name of the XRP Ledger EVM sidechain, which is the XRP Ledger EVM sidechain. I know again, I, I know, I feel, I know. I, I wanted to call it Niobium. I thought that would be super cool, but they're like, no, no one will know what that is. I'm like, I want a super cool name, but they're like, no, you got to call it what it is. Um, but, you know, I, I think that's important. Uh, I, I think some people have thought about it as just as like, oh, we have that too, just trying to check a box. But I think that's going to become a valuable part of the ecosystem, you know, with XRP as its native token and the, the Axelar bridge. Um, let's see, the other announcement was ArchX, which is uh, going to bring probably, you know, at least $100 million in tokenized real-world assets to the XRP ledgers, enterprise-grade tokenized securities, which are, you know, that, that's another one of those enablers for enterprise DeFi, you know, with being able to use them as collateral and rehypothecate and, and those kinds of things. Um, that's what builds DeFi ecosystems. And the last one was the grant, the geographic focus with grants in Japan and Korea, which are areas where uh, there's just been an enormous amount of XRP ledger development. 
I'm not really sure why. It's kind of a little surprising to me, but I guess uh, those areas have just been major areas of innovation, and we have not, sometimes not paid as much attention to them as we should have. And so we're going to fix that. Awesome. Um, I'd love to kind of dive in a little bit deeper into some of the kind of, you mentioned bridges, but some of the broader interoperability work that you guys have planned. Yeah, I, that is a huge uh, challenge in the entire industry. Everybody's working on building better bridges and better connectivity. Um, as I've said before, users can't have to worry about how the technology works. If the, the path to mass adoption is when the technology just works and just solves the problem. Um, and you know, Ripple can't build every tool that people want. Ripple can't build a compelling ecosystem all by ourselves. People have to be able to access the products and services that work best for them. Asset portability is like the first step. That's not going to do the whole thing, but that's definitely a critical enabler. That solves like real problems that people have today. And asset portability through the Axelar bridge will at least enable XRP as a native token on the EVM sidechain, which is, I think, I think that's big because, you know, the XRP ecosystem was one chain and the eco XRP ecosystem could be more chains if we had good bridging. Um, and so we'll have that for the EVM sidechain, but that's just a piece to the interoperability puzzle, and it's, that's not something that Ripple's going to solve. Mm -hmm. That's something that you know everybody in the industry is working on, and I just hope that gets better. Again, the path to mass adoption is when users. This solves my problem. You know what I mean? Like most people who use the internet have no idea how it works, and they don't have to. And that's always how you get mass adoption. You know, I was an early internet adopter. Anybody here edit DOS batch files for TCP with TCP/IP settings? Anybody that old? Nobody in this, oh, we got one person. Thank you. I'm not the oldest uh, internet user here. But like that's, you know, the browser. If you look at the adoption of the internet, the browser, the graphical browser. Does anybody use the internet before graphical browsers? Probably the same person. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it was fantastic for research and it was fantastic for keeping in touch with people around the globe, but there's no way it was going to get mass adoption until it is painless and intuitive. And that's what we're going to do with the bridging problem. But, it, but it's going to take a while. Certainly, but another element that um, you know I think a lot of people uh, see as a necessary for mass ad adoption are use cases and applications that do solve those problems. Um, so I really appreciate it, and I think it really resonated with a lot of people. Uh, the point you made earlier um, yesterday when you opened around inclusivity um, and being open to new use cases, new applications, uh, not just things that you guys are more top-down enabling at Ripple. Uh, so I'm kind of curious, over the years, have there been any use cases or applications that have been really popular that surprised you? Well, the explosion of NFTs kind of surprised me. Um, I get some of the financial use cases for NFTs, but the NFTs around collectibles and artwork, I mean, it makes sense now, but it was quite shocking to me how big that ecosystem grew and how quickly that's calmed down a little bit. I think the other thing that was completely out of left field to me was the meme, the whole meme coin mm. thing. And I think still that's one of those things that like, it's cool when it's people having fun and, you know, you know, but when you see people losing huge amounts of money because they thought that, you know, prices would go up forever, yeah. um, that's kind of a little bit depressing to me. I do have to say the, Another thing that's been surprising to me is the way the political situation has changed in the United States in just the past month or so. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that, that is amazing is like if you poll people in the United States, you will find that for people who care about crypto, they're almost all positive. There are very few people who are passionately anti crypto. Yeah. Right? There are a couple, but like in the weirdos voting, on Twitter. Right. There are <laughs> people who are niche people with unusual yeah. positions, but if like in the voting public, the more passionate you are about crypto, the more pro-crypto you're yeah. likely to be. And so what started to happen in American politics is there's really no advantage to being anti-crypto, yeah. whereas it's a huge disadvantage because there are maybe 16% of voters who really passionately care. Um, and, and the sort of, you know, um, Coinbase going public was, was a sort of inflection event. I think USDC, which is a very regulated product, Mm -hmm. that's enabled completely, you know, has anonymous holders, yep. right? No, Circle doesn't know who they are. And it's enabled DeFi ecosystems that are on decentralized blockchains. So those kinds of rapid acceleration of like real, real utility, mm -hmm. always uh, a pleasant surprise. I will say the one negative surprise to me has been the slow adoption of blockchain for payments. You know, um, 
enterprise adoption for payments has been pretty good. That's what Ripple's been focused on. But sort of retail end user adoption for payments has really been slow. And I think like the product market fit feels good. The problem is last mile. Yep. So if you're a person who the only way to get money to you is to hand you cash over the counter at a grocery store or post office or something, tech can't solve – there's no technology that can solve that problem. So I think that's been another drag to mass adoption and to being more inclusive is those on-ramps and off-ramps. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And what do you think kind of solves that last problem? Because, I mean, early kind of in – Bitcoin forum days, um, you know, you've heard a lot about like farm to table Bitcoin economies. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think you've recently seen more practical approaches around using, you know, more centralized on and off ramps. Um, so, you know, how much of that do you think lives on chain? What's through kind of existing intermediaries? And are there kind of other options or ways people might not be thinking about how to kind of make the end user experience a little more seamless? I think there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem. If there were people who needed these payment services, companies that have these payment rails would start to offer blockchain off-ramps. And if there were blockchain off-ramps and on-ramps, then people could come into these payment systems. So it's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem. What's going to dry what, the way you solve a chicken and egg problem is you get one side of it first, and then you get the other side for free. So what we're starting to see is we're starting to see DeFi ecosystems grow, um, you know, throughout throughout. Uh, the di different blockchains, and that's creating a demand for ways to get money on and off. You know, if you're a company, let's say you can, you know, hand cash to people over over the counter in Mexico. Mm -hmm. That's tremendously valuable, um, and there's no technology that can edge you out of the business, right? Yep. The, no technology is going to put money in the hands of a person who's living in a cash economy. Only your network will do that. And today, like in the TradFi ecosystem, the only way you can be a cash out is if you also have the mashing cash in and you have the conversion and you do the whole thing. They're, they're mm -hmm. your customer from beginning to end. It makes logical sense for me to say to you, hey, look, you may not have cash in in you know, Western Europe. But there's someone else who has cash in in Western Europe, and if you allow them to use your cash out over the counter right. in Mexico, that's business you would not have. So that – I think eventually people – that 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 pitch is going to start to make sense, and that's kind of how we're going to unlock that. It sounds a lot like uh, the payments and remittance use case you, know, you guys have had some success with. Yeah. That is exact, that's exactly the pitch <laughs> that, we made, that, that we made. And I think the biggest obstacle was, again, the chicken and egg problem. Yep. It's very difficult to say to somebody who's not a believer in a space, if you build it, they will come. They'll be like, you have to show me that the business is, is here. Um, we're getting there. I mean, we're seeing that, that ramp up in institutional adoption in the past year that I think will help us to untangle that. Another chicken in the egg I you know, often see is around uh, real-world assets or RWA, particularly when you kind of think about uh, large funds, say, like tokenizing a credit fund or something, uh, where, you know, there are a lot of purported advantages around distribution. There's also some, like, you know, purported efficiency gains. Um, where do you see adoption coming from there, and what's going to kind of be the explosion that allows that ecosystem to take off more meaningfully? I think it's going to be what the token holders can do on the back end that's going to make it so exciting. If there's no difference between launching on a public blockchain and launching on a private blockchain, that all that happens is that the same people you know, hold the asset, it's just they hold tokens instead, and they get the same returns and do the same things with it, that's not exciting. There's just mm -hmm. no reason to do that. You know, There's a reason why we put things on private, on private ledgers rather than on public blockchains. Public blockchains you know, are expensive and, and they're, trans they're, you know, they're complicated. But if there's something that you can do on the other side with the token that you couldn't do without it, if you can use it as collateral for a loan, if you can rehypothecate it so that people can have fractional ownership who wouldn't be able to hold the underlying security because it's not available in their jurisdiction or they can't meet the KYC AML requirements. Like, you know, it's obvious why Circle doesn't launch USDC on a private ledger. Yeah. It would be completely useless, right? It's the DeFi ecosystem that it enables. It's, it, it's being able to use it as collateral for loans. It's being able to get a return on it, you know, additional return. You know. If we can enable those types of ecosystems, then it will be very compelling. And the thing that's the most different about those institutional use cases versus, let's say, you know, enterprise payments, if an enterprise uses XRP for payments, their customers aren't blockchain users. But these applications and these DeFi applications, the customers, the people who hold the tokens, mm. they're DeFi users, they're blockchain users. And that's, I think, that path to mass adoption.
And speaking of it, I know we're running a little tight on time, but um, I think that is very relevant to the decision to launch the EVM sidechain, um, yeah. where you know I think you guys have been very um, mindful of the trade-offs of smart contract platforms and how you've built out the modulars uh, or the modules of the um, XRP ledger. Um, with a EVM sidechain, you introduce some smart contracts which have their own expressibility advantages, but some smart contract risk um, and you know potentially like liquidity fragmentation. How do you like? What's your philosophy for launching that product, and what type of activity it might have? You know, for better or for you know worse, or let's just say more complicated. There, there's advantages and disadvantages of both approaches. There's no one solution that's going to solve every problem. You know, the XRP ledger is a fixed function ledger. New features can be added to it, but it takes time, and they have to be features that have some mass demand. If there's a feature that has some niche demand, it's probably not going to be supported on the XRP ledger. The EVM sidechain can do that. The disadvantage, some of the ones you mentioned, but one of the big ones is the security problem. I'm sure you've heard stories of people who approve smart contracts and they don't know what those smart contracts do because it is so expressive. Yep. And so I think there's room in the market for both approaches to coexist as part of an ecosystem. If asset portability, if we can, we'll have asset portability through the Axelar bridge, so at least you'll be able to, if nothing else, you will be able to move XRP between you know, the XRPL main chain and the EVM sidechain, I'm sure, you know, Axelar and others will build bridges that will allow portability of other assets. And so we'll have an ecosystem where people can experiment with new technologies. And then if there are things that make sense to include as features on the XRP ledger main chain, then those things will be able to be adopted. But I just, I, I, the, the point that I think is the most important is that there isn't one best answer. There's advantages and disadvantages to all of the different technologies. You know, the XRP ledger, has a uh, very high speed, very low cost. It's, it has the concentrated liquidity. It has issued assets. It has a bundle of very nice features, but it can't address the sort of long tail of use cases that have some weird requirement that just isn't expressible in it. So I think there's room in the market for, for all of these things to you know, solve the problems that they solve best, as long as users can freely, as long as users aren't, don't get locked into one right. part of the ecosystem or another. Makes a lot of sense. Um, for everyone in the audience, um, we're going to move to answering some of your questions that you guys had throughout the week. Um, but before we do that, and I believe they're gonna pop up here, um, I'd love to ask you, I haven't even heard the story of um, your Twitter handle, Joel Katz. Uh, you mind kind of sharing uh, how that came to be? Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's one of those things that I get asked, you know, every couple of years I get asked. And um, it's kind of funny. It's the same thing I notice at Ripple. Like sometimes something will come up at Ripple and I'll be like, how come everybody doesn't know this thing? Didn't we tell the whole company? It's like, oh, we told the whole company 14 <laughs> months ago. Well, how many people weren't here 14 months ago? Yeah. I had half the company because of the growth. So it's the same thing here. Every two years I have like, don't you guys know I've told this story like six times? Yeah, over 12 years, right? So it, 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 it's never going to get old. Yeah. So it started back when I was in high school. A friend of mine uh, operated the bulletin board system, which was like the precursor to the to internet, um, to social media, really. It's the social media of its day. And he asked me if I wanted an account, and I said yes. And he asked me if I wanted to use my real name, and I said, hell no. <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to do with it. It was high school. I mean, who knows? So he was like, well, what name do you want to use? I said, I don't know. Just make one up for me. Well, MTV's Ren and Stimpy was pretty popular then, and Stimpy's full name was Stimson J. Cat. So he's like, okay, I'll give you Stimson J. Katz. That sounds kind of like a human name. <laughs> and I used the name Stimson J. Katz on the internet and on, on bulletin boards for a while. And then I realized I'm actually like doing real stuff with this and I have a ridiculous <laughs> name. And so I didn't want to be like, I, that's not my real name. And so I, I did something clever. I took a page out of 3M's playbook. I don't know if you know 3M used to be called Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. And they gradually changed their name over time. They started abbreviating. So I did the same thing. I went from Stimson Joel, uh, J. Katz to Stimson Joel Katz. Got to have a middle name, right? The J has to stand <laughs> for something. So now I was Stimson Joel Katz instead of Stimson J. Katz. Then I went from Stimson Joel Katz to S. Joel Katz. You know, if you have a crappy first name that you don't like, you drop it to an yeah. initial. So for this was over years. But it also right. sounds very fancy, you know. Yeah. So J. I was R. S. Joel Katz. <laughs> then I dropped the S. 
because, you know, if you have a crappy first initial, you don't need to keep it. Yep. So then I was Joel Katz, and uh, I still <laughs> am to this day. It's awesome. Um, yeah, the company lore also always gets a little twisted and changed um, as it's retold. So appreciate getting that uh, from the source. Um, but our first question is around, um, you know, really what's going to be driving value to XRP, um, particularly kind of around the cross-border and um, sort of more like enterprise payments and financial use cases. Yeah, so you guys can all see the question on the screen. Um, I think the big thing that's going to that's gonna keep XRP like in its central role is its privileged place on the XRP ledger. XRP is the only token that you can pay transaction fees in. It's the only token that every account can receive. The payment engine entering pathfinding always looks for XRP liquidity first, and XRP is auto-bridged through the order book, so XRP liquidity is sort of preferentially taken over to other types of liquidity just from order crossing. So XRP is always going to have a special place as a sort of liquidity tool on the XRP ledger. In the payment space, I think XRP, because of you know high, high, high speed, low cost, and the sort of um, lack of things like MEV and um, you know block producers who are trying to tax transactions, it's going to remain a good intermediary currency for international payments. Ripple's going to continue to use it for cross-border payments. You know where where it works well. We're not going to make our customers use an inferior solution to make us us happy. You know, it's on it's on us to make XRP you know be a viable solution. But again, the big thing I think I, I think one of the things probably motivating this is the launch of the stablecoin with the idea that like one will cannibalize the other. I just want to make a point that like the current use for XRP is a tiny fraction of the things that people could be using it for. The market is so early and and. We can't, it's impossible for us to cannibalize ourselves. It's you know, like if a mark, if 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 an ecosystem is one percent of what it should be, trying to fight over that one percent is just that's not what's going to happen, right? We want to be attract. We want to grow the pie, and I think there's lots of room for XRP to grow, and there's lots of room for a stablecoin to grow and to be used, you know, in different use cases. There are some use cases where volatility is absolutely fine. And of course, in some use cases like the AMM, where volatility is actually a plus, mm -hmm. uh, particularly for cross-border payments, you don't have to hold the asset for very long. So if you're thinking, well, I want to use an asset for cross-border payments, but I don't want to be exposed to its volatility, there are plenty of entities who consider exposure to XRP volatility a net positive, right? Like there, there are people, like if you wanted to have exposure to any cryptocurrency, whether it was uh, you know, XRP, Bitcoin, Ethereum, if you wanted exposure to it, you would generally pay for that exposure. That's why people hold Bitcoin, right? They want exposure to the upside. They pay for that upside. And so if you're worried about exposure to both the upside and the downside in payments, there are any number of parties who will gladly take the upside and downside you know, together. So it's not it's not a bound a barrier. Makes sense. Um, I think with that, uh, let's flip to the next tweet. All right, um, this is interesting. Um, around the ten year goal uh, for XRPL uh, and and what's really kind of changed over the years. In the very early days, I think my first vision or goal for the XRP ledger was this idea of public pools of liquidity that anybody could contribute to and draw off. So the idea was, um, let's say you needed to make a payment to somebody you know, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. What you would normally do today is you would find somebody who for a fee keeps money in Mexico to make that payment. They don't want to have money in Mexico. That's not their thing. They're just doing that to get your business, and they're paying you for like the privilege of having that money ready to go in Mexico. But there's probably people who have money in Mexico who don't need it there. There's probably some guy who owns a chain of grocery stores in Mexico and lives in San Diego, and he's probably paying 6% to go the opposite way, right? Everybody's trying to get money into Mexico. This is the one guy who's trying to get money out, and he's probably paying 6%. So I was like, oh, you have a niche use case that nobody else has. I'm the only, right? That's ridiculous. If we could bring those two people together, and that was that first, that first vision, the idea that like anybody who had money and didn't need it where it was could offer it to people who needed money there, a sort of global market for capital to reduce the need to pre-fund and pre-place. Um, I think that that's still happening. I think the, ch the challenge there is I don't think I realized how critical good on-ramps and off-ramps would be to making that work. Um, 
the technology, again, the technology can't hand money to somebody who needs to have cash. I think the vision now is similar to what drove the internet, adoption of the internet, similar to what uh, drove the adoption of like the international movements of goods, enterprise adoption that paves the way for retail ad adoption is I think what it looks like what's going to happen at least based on you know the past two years. So I think the new 10 year vision is enterprise products like stable coins, like real world asset tokenization, like you know commercial lending and real estate lending, but that enable DeFi ecosystems that have things like ways to get yield, ways to manage your money, um, ways to hold the assets that you wanna hold. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I think we should go to the next tweet, but it reminds me a lot of the <laughs> three-sided market you're referring to earlier. <laughs> this is what we really want to hear about: is the shampoo and broader hair care. I I want to see if the <laughs> the same routine extends to the beard. <laughs> Take it away. No. <laughs> um, my wife, when she buys shampoo, she will ask her friends what experiences they've had with different shampoos. She will take the advice of hair care professionals. She will track her own experiences on shampoos. She probably pays like for me. If it says shampoo on the bottle, that's good enough for me. The beard, my, so my, my beard care routine has changed. First of all, I will never have Brad Garlinghouse's beard game. He will always, it's just never going to happen. So it used to be when my beard annoyed me, I shaved it off. I just let it grow until it annoyed me, and then I shaved it off. Now I trim it when it annoys me, and then when that annoys me, I guess I shave it off again. So I couldn't know. I'll take some you? lessons. You know, what's your? I'm, I'm getting there. I uh, I shaved this morning. So the nice thing about my routine is it requires minimal effort. Yeah. Which I, I would my excuse would be it allows me to focus on the more important things in life. That but the fair. truth is I'm just lazy. <laughs> but you know what, though? You know what, though? If you ever want to find the most efficient way to do something, ask a lazy person to do it. Lazy is just a negative <laughs> spin on efficient. No? No? I, like that. I had to try. Fair enough. <laughs> um, all right. Let's, uh, let's keep it rolling. Oh, two from Panos. Yeah. Side chains. Yeah, so... I would love to see a robust sidechain ecosystem with lots of sidechains. I would love to have a world where someone could have an idea for a new like blockchain function and they could launch a new sidechain in minutes and have it handling real money. That would be awesome. We're not there technically yet. The bridging problem is a real one. Everybody's working on it. I think we'll get there. Um, and inter seamless interoperability, not just for asset portability. Like I said, asset portability is step one. Um, but we need like community, like we need to be able to have an AMM with one pool on one chain and one pool on another chain. Like we need mm -hmm. that that kind of real seamless interoperability. We're not there. Um, subnets, you know, these are in these are interesting approaches. I've talked to a lot of different people with different approaches. They're all good. Well, some of them are terrible, but like most of them are good. All the ones that we bother thinking about are good. Nobody has a great one yet. You're right back into those fundamental problems that I talked about. Like the bridge has to either make yep. a lot of money or not make a lot of money. If it makes a lot of money, I'm paying that money. That kind of sucks. If it's not making a lot of money, you know, it's not going to be maintained. It's not going to be secure. We, we don't really have it yet. So we're, everybody's working on that problem. But yeah, I, in the short term of the side chains, having two chains, the XRP ledger and the EVM side chain, I think is going to make the community more inclusive and allow for more rapid development and at least we'll have asset portability. So I think that's like a baby step on the way to, you know, being able to run. Let's see, my opinion on decentralized crypto collateralized stable coins. You know, the problem with them is that for that to work, you have to over collateralize them. And if, if, if I'm locking up a whole bunch of a volatile asset, I have to be paid a lot of money to do it. And that's kind of why the XRP collateralized stablecoin proposal didn't really move on. The main obstacle is just that if you're holding XRP, there's plenty of people who will hold XRP long-term, short-term. They'll hold Bitcoin, they'll hold ETH, and they want the long-term exposure. But one of the things that minimizes the risk for them is that if, some, if, if the asset starts crashing, they could sell it. And they might think, I'm not out of the market. Maybe I'll try to wait until it drops. Maybe I'll buy. But if you don't have that ability, if the asset is locked up and it's volatile, I really have to pay you a lot of money to put you in that uncomfortable position. And the problem is, if you have a crypto collateralized stablecoin, you have to pay people to lock up a volatile asset. And that's a lot of money for it to be fair to them. And you're going to be like the, the token holders are going to be paying. And so the market has preferenced um, 
non-crypto collateralized stable coins that are collateralized with fiat, but you know, like USDC, USDT, and Ripple. So it's just it's just economics. I like decentralized crypto collateral stable coins. That's why I made that proposal in 2019. But the problem is just just it's basically just cost. What do you think about some of the other models uh, we've seen in other communities around decentralized stablecoin, like Makers doing with um, adding more RWA as collateral, Athena with a kind of tokenized trading position, essentially? Do you think there are other ways of, of kind of doing it? I think so. I think if you collateralize it with something that's not so volatile, then that cost comes down. But it's kind of weird. Like, I, like I've seen um, for a while... Um, Die was collateralized by USDC, which yeah. is like <laughs> it's like all the downside. RWA of it. is a spin on. <laughs> yeah, I, in a but I don't want to. I don't want to be negative on the whole space. Yeah. I think some of those other. So there are some ways that that can make sense. But the thing is, is like if the collateral it has an issuer, you know, who's holding the real world collateral, then you might as well just use a stable coin like USDT, USDC, the forthcoming, you know, Ripple stable coin. I don't see that you get much. I think diversifying the collateral makes mm -hmm. sense. And, I, and, and by the way, DAI, to its credit, has transitioned to a much more diversified, and that makes a lot of sense. And there, um, coins like Circle and, you know, the forthcoming Ripple stable coin can be collateral in systems like that. The only thing that I worry about is if you don't over collateralize them, to some extent, if any one of the collateral assets fails, mm -hmm. the, there's a significant loss of value to the state. It doesn't go to zero, but it loses a lot of its value. And I just wonder whether it makes more sense just to hold um, you know, a stable coin at that point. Interesting. Um, let's see, where, where is the point person with the clicker? There? Okay, here we are. Boy, you know, if I were to leave Ripple and start my own XRPL project, what would the project be about? So I'll tell you the reason I don't do that, first of all. Um, if I was going to work on something else, I would really want to just pour my heart and soul into it. I would, would only leave for something that I was incredibly passionate about. And I don't know that I have another, like, three years of 70-hour weeks in me. That's just the way I, I just get completely absorbed in things. But one of the big things, which is also one of the top three ideas I'd like to see built on XRPL that nobody's doing, we need people to arbitrage the AMMs, um, and we need to make it easy for people to do that. Um, I'm hoping that um, HummingBot will will provide that capability, but uh, anyone can provide could provide tools to allow people to arbitrage the AMMs. People are leaving money on the table. And AMMs work better when they're aggressively arbitraged against. So just that that just makes sense. Um, I I'd like I really would like to see more more real world asset projects that are tokenizing things like things like um, treasuries, like like these sort of very very safe assets. I, I'm one of the things that was exciting to me about the AMM was the ability for people to get a yield. Other ways for people to get yield that's very very safe, like. Um, commercial lending and real estate lending where it's tokenized on the back end. Those things are interesting to me. Um, I, I also on ramps and off ramps. I know these are very generic, these are very, these are very generic, but I think like people need to be able to get money into and out of the XRP ledger. I wonder if it would be possible to go around to these companies that have off ramps and try to convince them that there's value to provide, to sort of unbundling this. You know, you look at a remittance company, it has an on-ramp, it has liquidity, and it has an off-ramp. I wonder if you could convince them to unbundle. Mm. Interesting. And generally, you know, I think a point you've made a few times is around kind of the unbundling of different, like, services within the payment stack. Um, how has that landscape evolved? I mean, now we have crypto market makers, we have on-chain liquidity providers. How does that ecosystem kind of work together? Yeah, it, it hasn't as much as I'd like to see. I think I think what happens is that the people who have those types of resources like the bundled service because they think that they can keep more of the value. They don't want to sort of move. They perceive it as moving down market yep. because they perceive that they'll be they'll be just sort of commoditized. That is not. It's just not true. If like if you can deliver cash across a counter somewhere, there's no way that you can be commoditized. But I think they feel that like they get a smaller piece of the value. But these are it's payments they wouldn't have. Yeah. Getting a smaller piece 
how you can't get a smaller piece than zero yeah. if you wouldn't if this you wouldn't get any of this payment if you didn't unbundle. So I think we're going to see new crypto native companies that are going to start uh, providing these services, and that's actually a fantastic opportunity for people in this room and companies like Ripple because these companies are very badly served yeah. by the existing players. And so what's nice about that is when you're competing with you know someone who charges 20 basis points, you have to charge less than that. If you're if if they are their best alternatives charge two percent, then you can make a pretty healthy. You can move. This is a chance, an opportunity to move up market yep. to these crypto natives. So I think that's maybe that's the maybe I'm glad you put it on this slide, but that is an opportunity. Crypto natives need these types of services. And their margins are much, much higher. You know, if you have a person who's speculating in the cryptocurrency space and you're charging them 2 or 3%, that's lost in the noise of the massive returns they're expecting. Yeah, I mean, we've even found that with, uh, I think a lot of it could even be like fund mandates where people don't even predict they might need to be supplying liquidity on chain and then there are massive yields people can't even tap. Um, you know, moving back, I guess, to the XRPL, um, you know, how do you think of some of these other trends that we see? You know, you talked about side chains, but um, also right now uh, they're talking about modularity. But so uh, to that point, you know, you see things like data availability layers. You see uh, sort of, I guess this is relevant to rollups, but like sequencing as a service. Um, you know, how do you generally kind of take some of those uh, things you see in other ecosystems and assess what makes sense? for XRPL? I mean, we try not to steal too much from other ecosystems. It's interesting that this question, it looks like everybody's stealing from us, right? Like we've had path <laughs> finding since 2012 and our impermanent loss strategy, you know, we were the first to develop that continuous auction mechanism. Um, that, you know, it looks like other people are stealing from us, but also we do look at what's going on, you know, in the space. We look for, uh, you know, we didn't originate AMMs. Um, you know, we saw other marketplaces yeah. that were using that. We were very happy with our order book system. And then we thought, hey, order books are good for high vol vol volume assets, not so good for the long tail. Um, so, I mean, everybody, everybody steals from everybody else. As far as modularity as a concept goes, I like it a lot. And I think it, it's something that we need to think about in the XRPL ecosystem because we don't really have modularity and composability. Like the AMM does interact with order books. It does interact with the payment engine, but it, but like you can't build things that interact with the AMM. Real, like you can build user interfaces, but you can't build things sort of on chain yep. that interact with it. Um, and so that's sort of something that we're going to need to think about as far as like having a bunch of fixed functions, uh, whether modularity and composability are things that are that are valuable, and then how we can provide those same types of capabilities. But like a lot of the capabilities that people are getting out of that are capabilities we already have natively. Like for example. The squid, you know, the, the liquidity router is a sort of modularity composability feature on top of the fact that the liquidity is spread out all over right. the place. But our liquidity isn't spread out all over the place. But I don't think it's always going to be the case that, like, we're not going to need these types of things. I think um, if you look at some of the existing DeFi ecosystems, they have – they're layered. Right. right. There's like low layer products that are sort of not governed. And that's great because everybody can use them without having to worry about the governance. And there's a layer above them that can provide features that you can't do without governance, but they have governance and they compete, but they can use the same like underlying mm -hmm. layers. Those types of things we don't really have in the XRP Ledger ecosystem. Right. And if it turns out that those are important and valuable, then we're going to have to think about, you know, how does that exist in our ecosystem? And do you think that's like an opportunity for the EVM sidechain? Because potentially, you know, you would have more of those, you know, yeah. unbundled contracts. Yeah, you can do that on the on the on the uh, EVM sidechain, and so those things can happen there. But then I think if they turn out to be critical to the types of use cases that the XRP Ledger mainnet is targeting, then we'll have to think about what is the mainnet version of those things. Makes sense. Favorite tool, Brad Garlinghouse. <laughs> uh, sorry, don't don't anyone no, no, I didn't say that. You didn't hear that. <laughs> Uh, my favorite tool, I'm embarrassed to admit this, is a tool called Joe. Does anyone know what Joe is? Yeah, the same. Of course, this is the old guys, right? Old, old guys. Yeah. So Joe is a, an old school editor. So way back in the day, there was an editor called WordStar. And someone named Joe built an editor called Joe, Joe's own editor, that used the same keys as WordStar. And so I used an Apple product that was compatible with WordStar. And so when I switched to start using Unix operating systems, I found Joe. 
and it is still my favorite editor. I can't live without it. Awesome. Anybody use Joe here? <laughs> it's long obsolete, but I still love, <laughs> I, I still, you know, control K, X, you know, control J. That's it. All the questions. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me up here. I'm going to leave stage because I think everyone wants to hear final words from you. Um, so thank you for having me. Thank you, George. Wow. It, you know, it's such a privilege to be able to close and to be here. I, like I said, I always come back from these events energized. I have the most amazing conversations with people to see the things that people are building and to really engage one-to-one -one with the community, right? It's not an abstract. It's, it's, it's here in this room. It, it's at this event. I think something like 700 people, the largest apex ever. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you to our speakers. Thanks to everyone who attended, whether you're a developer, investor, rebuilder, um, retail, traders, users, um, everyone. Thank you so much. I, I hope to see all of you at next year's Apex in Asia. Uh, not you in the second row, but everybody else. Uh, hope to, just, just kidding. Sorry. I actually, <laughs> no, not you, not him. <laughs> no, seriously. I hope to see all of you next year at Apex in Asia. We'll uh, reveal the exact location we know. Thank, thank you so much. This, is, this has just been amazing.